We'll give folks just a few more minutes to log in. All right, well, it's 6.01, we're gonna get started and anybody can join in um, you know, as they're able to log in. My name is Mary Cook Ryan. I'm the education coordinator here at the Mojave De Desert Land Trust. And tonight we have with us Sarah Bliss, who's the tribal cultural resource manager with the 29 Palms Band of Mission Indians. Hi, Sarah, thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, thank you for the invitation and we look forward to this presentation. Tonight, you're joining us for a story for a campfire talk on not a mirage. There is water, in fact, in the desert. Campfire talks are a series of educational, informal, and formal uh, presentations that teach us about conservation, education, and just general topics on the Mojave Desert. We're going to be hosting fire abatement, information on the DRECP, um, NCLs, and ACECs or areas of critical environmental concern. So tonight we're gonna to be covering the geology of oases and springs. We'll talk about the ecological and cultural importance of those places. We'll talk about conservation and some of the places that you can go to visit. And at first, um, with all our presentations, we would like to start with a land acknowledgement. So if you take a look at the map on the screen here, um, and you can see the, um, the, red, the red kind of button there, um, that's gonna be a Joshua tree. Um, the place that I'm coming from um, here, I'm on the 29 Palms Band of Mission Indians Reservation. Uh, located near the cities of Coachella, California. And if you take a look uh, up on the top right, um, the 29 Palms also has a reservation near the city of 29 Palms. And we like to take a moment to, um, to acknowledge all the tribal people past and present. Um, that's, and in this area, that's gonna be the Chimwevi, Kawia, Serrano, and Mojave people. And taking a look at this map, um, it's actually uh, available um, in the Mojave Desert Land Trust Adventure Kits. Um, I know that the Native American Land Conservancy um, worked with the Mojave Desert Land Trust to um, create this um, map, with, which was a, a native-led um, art, art project. And looking at this map right here, um, there's something that you can notice. And that's the, all the blue in the map. And those are places of water. So when you look at the desert or think about the desert, lots of people don't have water come to mind. But for the Native American people living in the desert, water was a vital, uh, a vital part of how they were able to, to travel and live and have communities in the desert. If you take a look, you'll see that, um, you'll see the Salton Sea on the very bottom, and then you'll kind of see um, the Whitewater River, which is um, that, that uh, long blue squiggly line on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see the Colorado River. Now, one thing you may notice is that you don't see here because they're too far out, but you don't see all the springs and seeps that actually connect all these water resources. So the tribal communities, they knew where all these different places of water were. And they would, they would um, tell them stories how to reach these pit places. They would, um, they, they would um, have stashes 
of resources all throughout this network. Now today you see the highway, but the tribal communities use these springs and seeps as their sort of highway because you can't be too far away from water in the desert. Um, there's, a, there's a quote that I like to use when I think about water in the desert, and that comes from um, that comes from a, a video that's going to be in the be in the chat, which is tending uh, preserving nature the desert with the Native American Land Conservancy. And that quote from uh, Chris Clark states, "It's really helpful to think of the desert not so much as a large geologic expanse of dry, but as an ar archipelago of tiny little wet places that are separated." If you lose one of these islands, it would be devastating. So these islands of, so you think of the desert, the desert as the ocean inside out. So there's all these little places where people were able to collect water. Not just that, these were places where people gathered. These are places where people lived, celebrated, and all sorts of tribal communities were able to meet at these locations. Um, so that's just a little bit of introduction to uh, the tribal perspective of water here in the desert. And I know that we're going to get uh, more into the scientific, uh, you know, geologic kind of explanations of all this. But I think that uh, 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 settling ourselves with all with with the with the history of, of water in the desert is important. Thank you, Sarah. And I agree, it's very important to make sure we think about these things holistically, because it's not just a resource for us or for plants or for animals. It's a resource that's been used and has been used and will continue to be used in many ways that are really significant and sacred. So tonight I'm going to start by talking about the geology and the hydrology of the desert. It's really interesting. What we see right here is a map of the Pleistocene lakes in the Mojave region. So during the Pleistocene or the Ice Age, the Mojave was full of these really large lakes. And then of course you can see the Mojave River, if you can see my mouse moving along the Mojave River. Okay, so that fed as the end of the ice age started ending. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the ice age, the water started draining and it started draining into these things that we call aquifers, which is where the water table is below ground, right? That is an aquifer. And when we think about water, think that not all aquifers are going to be potable water. So not all aquifers are water that we can drink. And as these drained, it created these areas, these pockets of areas where we have springs and seeps, and we're going to talk about those a little bit further. What these aquifers then become known as as fossil water, not because there are fossils in there, but because that water has been there for a really long time. So places like uh, Bonanza Springs, that has been there for at least 10,000 years. Right, so the water that's below there that is feeding that spring has been there and been able to sustain life in that spot for over 10,000 years. And that's why it's kind of known as fossil water. Of course, there is some recharge, but in an area that gets on average four inches of rain per year, uh, you know, we're not going to get a ton of recharge of the aquifers based on rainfall. What you'll also notice here are where these fault lines are. Okay, so this is the San Andreas. Everybody's the most familiar with that one. If we're thinking about this map overlaid, you'll notice that there are a lot of fault lines along the same areas where there are uh, those ancient lake beds. And what's also really interesting is we find a bunch of things called fractured springs. Uh, those are where we're going to find a lot of the springs that we see in the Mojave Desert. And there are 1,120 mapped springs. And of those springs, 158 of them are fan palm oases, 
Those occur further south, then we're going to be talking about fan palmolises um, in a little bit longer. I move my mouse. So here's the anatomy of a fracture spring. So how the geology works is that the Mojave is full of a variety of rocks and sediment layers, and we have great mix of igneous metamorphic and sedimentary rocks. So rocks that came directly from volcanoes like an Amboy crater, rocks that are sedimentary like out in Afton Canyon, or rocks that are metamorphic further towards the Joshua Tree area, right? All of these rocks have impervious and perv impervious and permeable layers. And in between those layers is where you'll find that water table. And the blue on this map is the water. And it's coming into the aquifer. It's coming into this area where the soil, where the rock layers are much more permeable and water can get in there. And in those fractures, in those fault lines is where you'll find areas where the water can come up. There's enough pressure below it and besides it that you can see water springing forth sometimes in some geothermal areas, you know, like in hot springs, you'll find the pressurized water. In other areas where it's kind of coming outside of the mountain, you're gonna see seeps where it's not gonna be necessarily running all year long, but it seeps out uh, after rainfalls or after meltwater. And the really, one of the big things that I want you to think about here is where these springs are. That's where we're gonna find a lot of the most en um, endemic species. The springs and seeps in the desert have the highest concentration of endemic species anywhere else. So we have a lot of species that live nowhere else but at these springs. You'll find the red, um, the red spotted frog, right? Or toad, I mean, the red spotted toad. It's in Joshua Tree, but it's also in Bonanza Springs. There are certain places where we'll find different species in places where you'll find them extirpated, like the toy chub. It's no longer in its same habitat because of certain challenges. And we'll talk about that as well. So I wanna talk about some of the springs. This is the Mojave National Preserve. So this is, um, I'm not sure where everybody else is coming from, but I'm here in Joshua Tree right now. And the Mojave National Preserve is just north of us. It's about an hour and a half, two hours north of where we are. One of the things you'll notice on the map here is that a lot of the springs that you see on this colorful map follow the same um, trajectory as the mountain ranges. So as the waterfalls come down, as the water infiltrates the aquifers, you'll see the springs at the base of the mountains uh, following a lot of the, the fracture sites. The map, I wanted to, to mention that this map is really colorful because if you, if you go to the Mojave National Preserve website, you'll find this map, but then it's associated with um, its different areas. So that's why this map is really colorful and it doesn't have a legend. It's because on the actual website, you can click their hyperlinks that you can click and um, learn more about the different areas specifically. So I do want to talk about some of the big challenges that we know there are springs, we know there's water. What are some of the long-term effects that we're seeing um, facing our limited resource of water, right? Water is a severely limited resource and we can't survive without it and other animals can't survive without it. So what we are currently in, what we're currently facing is a huge, change with, with climate change. We're, we're experiencing severe, what's called a mega drought. And it is affecting all of the Southwest. And the Mojave Desert is in an extreme drought. Sarah, did you wanna say something? Oh yeah, I was just gonna uh, talk a little bit about um, the effects of um, uh, climate change on cultural resources. Uh, 
So yeah, like as you're talking about with drought um, for tribal communities, a lot of the places in the desert, there's such small pockets to collect uh, traditional plants that with climate change, it makes it hard for uh, tribal elders and youth to be able to come out and collect these resources. And as these resources are collected, uh, tribal communities also maintain these lands you know, clearing areas so that the, the water is, you know, able to flow or, you know, clearing, you know, dead vegetation, all sorts of things and planting, you know, making sure the species are, are coming back. And with the increased heat, the tribes don't have access and can't get to these places. Um, so the, the effects from climate change are, are you know, there, there's effects we can see right now and effects that, you know, we'll just see in, in you know, so many future generations. So I think that that's something, um, you know, to think about. Yeah, agreed. Uh, you know, the desert has risen one degree Celsius since 1950. And that seems very small. You know, we think of a one degree difference, but it causes extreme changes in climate. It causes extreme fluctuations in both temperature, the amount of precipitation, it changes how much moisture is being lost to evaporation. So we might have spots in the Mojave River that are flowing above ground, but more water because of climate change, more water is evaporating. And so as it moves further down, as the water moves downstream, we're gonna see less and less water reach those areas that it, that it was at before. So those are some things to keep in mind as we move forward. So some of the challenges. Uh, I did include in the chat, there are two articles, uh, both on mega droughts, and there is one on um, conservation challenges in the Mojave Desert. And conservation really is a mix of being, being proactive, having advocacy. Uh, hold on, I have a list actually. It's advocacy, legislation, initiatives, coalition building, and education. And that's part of what we're doing today, right? Is educating everybody and also coming up with ways to help conserve water. So I'm going to stop and let you all read for just a minute. Eighty percent of our use of our water usage is, in California goes to agriculture, but we need to eat, right? So there's going to be this, we have to think of ways that we balance the need of the land for ecological purposes, balance our needs for water, because we all still have to drink water, and the balance, balance the needs for agriculture. And I'm not even touching on the, the, what water needs to go into mining or resource extraction, right? There's so many, places that water is being pulled to. And trying to balance that out is, is really challenging. So what can you do? Well, as, as the aquifers and springs are being depleted of their groundwater, they're drying up where we're, we're changing the location and the environment for those species who are groundwater dependent, right? So we can do a lot of things to help protect our water as a resource. Do a plant search, xeriscape your lawn. So make it, make it more water friendly or, or water conscious, right? Visit a demonstration garden. Ours is opening in April, late April. There you go. So go visit a demonstration garden and learn more about water conservation at your own home. 
turn off the taps while you're brushing your teeth, right? We don't need the water running while you're brushing your teeth. Know where your water comes from. That's a big one. So where does the water, where we live, where does my water come from? It comes from the Colorado River for the most part. My water comes from the Colorado River. There are multiple states and two countries that rely on water from the Colorado. There was the Colorado River Compact that was signed in 1922, but that was signed when there was a lot more water available. And the drought that we're in, the mega drought, has been going on for decades, right? So there's a lot less water to parcel around. Knowing where your water comes from can make you more conscious of what, where, what you're using, how you're using it, and to be more proactive in conserving that. Advocate for smarter conservation measures. So we hear about water conservation measures and some of the things that we think about would be turning, you know, getting rid of your lawn, right? A lot of folks out here don't have lawns. The average lawn, the sprinkler, when your sprinklers are going off for your lawn, is taking 12 showers at once. That's how much water is wasted while you're watering your lawn. And that's 12 showers per sprinkler. The average person takes an eight minute shower. We're talking at least 12 gallons, right? That's a lot of water usage. And of course we still need to have potable water that's drinkable. Some other conservation measures that we can advocate for is use it and then reuse it, right? Wastewater treatment facilities out in Orange County, they have wastewater treatment facilities that have actually cleaned the water so much that they had to add minerals back in before it's pumped back into homes. It's actually a really great system. It was a lot of upfront costs but it's proving to be cheaper over time than trying to pump water into to depleting their aquifers, right? So that's actually been a really good thing. And some folks think about desalinization because California is a really long state. We have a lot of coast, but desalinization is really expensive and it takes a lot of other resources to pull salt out of water. And then once that salt has been pumped back in or pumped out, what are we going to do with that salt? It's generally pumped back into the ocean and it creates an over, overly saline undergrowth. It creates this air, these pockets of area that are basically now toxic to aquatic life along the coast. So desalinization is not necessarily the best option. And then of course, eat locally and seasonally if possible. Eating things closer to where they were produced uses a lot less resources in general. So it's always a good idea to eat locally and seasonally if you can. If you can't, that's, that's what it is, right? But if you can, try it. You might like it. Oh, uh, and I think we had some uh, a few questions. So I think that uh, we want to know that we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation for a few minutes. Yes. Um, and uh, Sorry. someone was, oh no, and someone was asking about the uh, the black box, but I think that the PowerPoint will, is, is going to be able to be shared uh, later. Yeah, whoops, hold on. Let me move it for whatever reason. On my screen, that's where our faces are. So you're seeing a black box and I'm seeing Sarah's face. So I'll move it down to the bottom and hopefully it'll be out of the way. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, and so the, the Q&A will be at the end and um, yeah, we'll work uh, out how many questions we can get out uh, when we finish the presentation. Perfect. 
Thank you. And yep. Oh, and that's my section already here. <laughs> I didn't have to uh, uh, mute. So what I'm going to do is give a little um, uh, brief information about the Oasis of Mara. And oh, one second here. So the Oasis of Mara is located. Um, that's actually in the city of 29 Palms. And it's actually at the Joshua Tree National Park um, Oasis Visitor Center. So here, as we're saying, the past and present intertwine at a modern trail. So the trail at the Oasis of Mara is a very short trail. And this is probably one of the, the most uh, accessible trails um, you know, I've seen in the desert. Um, it's located near a parking lot, um, is uh, fully, uh, has a you know, full, full sidewalk, um, and there's also facilities nearby and also picnic areas. So it's a, it's a really easy place um, to, go for a, to go for a walk. I, I wouldn't say hike because it's a, it's a really short loop. But to visit this place, I wanna give you a little bit more context. And I think some of the context I will give will also um, go into some of the other trails that Mary's been talking about. So for some, for some information, the Oasis of Mara, um, the Serrano people named the Oasis of Mara in their language, which translates to English as much grass and little water. The Oasis of Mara is the Serrano center of creation, their first home. The Chumwaiti people came from the Colorado River to live at the Oasis peacefully with the Serrano. Their traditional homelands include a vast area of the Mojave Desert. The Kuya people came from Palm Springs and visited and traded with groups living at the Oasis. And the Mojave people came from the Colorado River and also visited and traded with groups living at the Oasis. So this Oasis is culturally and spiritually important to so many tribal communities. Um, this is a place of creation, it's a place of um, a habitation where people lived. Um, it's also a place of um, celebration, a place of gathering and trade. So for time immemorial, people were gathering at this oasis. Um, and they managed this habitat. So when people think about um, Native American communities, when people think about Native American communities, um, they, they think that they're not managing these places, but these places had to be managed. Um, throughout the oasis, um, you see plants like honey mesquite trees, deer grass, um, palm trees. All these, were main, all these were maintained here at the oasis of Mara. Um, and if you take a look at the pictures down there, we have some photos from uh, the 70s and uh, most recent, well, that's and from uh, 2021. And if you take a look, you'll see that um, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell uh, in this picture, but you can kind of see how this landscape is changing, how it's getting drier. Um, you see trees that are in the back that are, are dead. And these trees are ancestors. So it's, it's something that we're working with the national park with um, to revitalize this place. And if you take a look at the, the map that's on the top there, um, you can kind of see the whole layout of the oasis. But when, um, when, but you know, a few hundred years ago, this was an extremely lush environment. It wasn't just that little strand of um, that little strand that you can just imagine the whole area was, um, you know, filled with water, filled with plants, filled with wildlife and people. Oh, can you go next?
So the view that we give here is um, actually the, the starting point for the trail that's at the oasis. Um, there's a thick mesquite tree that lines the path. And you'll actually, in, when the, during the summer, you'll actually see that you know, they're in season. Um, and when you look through, so one of the first things that we like to do, even in this path that is, um, even in this path that, you know, it's, it's right next to the National Park headquarters um, and, you know, next to communities or not in the wilderness, but we still like to give respect at this location. So at this trail, before we head out, uh, you know, we get ourselves in the in the right mind frame. Um, so we think good thoughts and have, you know, clean hearts. So we give ourselves a few minutes to, you know, collect ourselves. And I think that no matter where you're going, uh, you know, this is some really sound advice. Um, you know, you don't want to, if, you, if you're, you know, on your cell phone or distracted, you know, you're not able to fully appreciate the landscape. Um, so as you see the picture here, you see the oasis on the left and you'll see um, some of the community to the right. And this is a very special place because even though there are so few of the palms left, um, just being able to enter that space where the trees are um, even though it's such a small area, it really does transport you. Um, and maybe that picture on that right can kind of get you into that feeling. Uh, when you get into that thicket, you don't hear the sound of cars or, you know, the or things going on in the city. Instead, you hear all the, uh, all the uh, birds around you, the palms uh, leaves swing in the wind. And that's something that we really like to look at when we're, you know, uh, when we're on the site um, to really take in the presence of the location. The palm, the palm trees grow where they're near, surf, near where there is water near the surface, um, and the palm trees are also important because, um, with the they're able to be, you know, used as a shelter, and so. Every part of the oasis has some type of connection, both for uh, spiritual and cultural. Um, and also with the palm trees, um, the, they're also called a critter condo at, as it's home for many animals and insects, including owls. But that's not just for the live trees. When the trees eventually do fall, that's when even more, you know, plant and well, that's when even more animal species uh, come to live uh, at the trees. So it has a, it, its life is uh, continued on. Oh, you can go next. Okay, all right. And so the photo here, what you see is actually the 29 Palms Band of Mission Indians Reservation. Um, so you can see it right from the edge of the, the trail, um, the Oasis Trail. So, and this actually kind of gives you a lot of the, uh, the tribal history in the area, which is, it's, it's full of um, historical trauma, um, just to say, like, not like, just to, just to bring that out, is that the 29 Palms Reservation was actually supposed to be uh, at the Oasis Trail because this is the place where the tribe had their, this is where the tribe had their food, had their homes. Um, but because of how, because of uh, how the historical era was, those documents were lost. And instead of the tribe being able to live at the oasis, they were actually, their, their reservation lands were in the foothills. And what's at the foothills is no water. So the tribal land, the tribal reservation lands were in the foothills where there's, there's no springs, there's no access, no way to be able to um, farm because 
actually the tribal people brought agriculture to the oasis. Um, we have historical documents of um, uh, where there are plots of different plants that they brought from the Colorado River to the oasis. And so the importance of water, um, you know, it goes back generations and generations to today. Um, oh, and next. Oh. <laughs> Um, oh, and this one here. So this one is just a picture of the, the different uh, wildlife. So like I was saying before, um, depending on the time you go to the oasis, you're going to see a whole bunch of different, um, different animals, but most notice, notably is the birds. Um, you know, if you come there in the morning, the afternoon, or, you know, the evening, you'll hear, hear different types of birds. And that the sound of them really kind of uh, grounds you to that location. Oh, next. Oh, and so this one, so this slide is, it pertains to the Oasis of Mara, but it also pertains to all the things that, uh, all the places that Mary is gonna talk about. Um, so the Oasis and many of these places near water are places of positive energy that are full of light, life and stories. This is a place of um, power and energy for tribal communities. And so we ask before you enter that space that you take a quiet moment, um, you know, to make sure that, you know, you're not being distracted by your phone so you're able to experience the place, but also when you're there to be present and, um, I think she's going to talk about the leave no trace principles, but not just that, but if you see things like trash, those are things that, you know, we do want you to, to pick up. If you see things like candy wrappers or uh, water bottles. Um, and then, you know, finally, you know, when you're, when you're leaving, if you use all these, um, all these practices and you enter the space with good heart, then um, it, it kind of creates a really a really beautiful journey throughout the landscape. Um, so not just at the Oasis of Mara, but about all the other places uh, that we're going to be talking about. Thank you, Sarah. So one of the, one of the really, I'm going to move the black box. I'm sorry, folks. Um, one of, Oh, I can't move it there either. <laughs> I'm going to move it up here. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, one of the great places that I want to mention first, of course, we've talked about the Mojave River and some of the challenges, some of the impacts, uh, but we need to talk about how amazing some of these places are. Afton Canyon is about 45 minutes east of Barstow. It's in the Afton Canyon Natural Area which is within the Mojave Trails National Monument, and that's mon that is managed by the BLM. There is a BLM campground there, so you can go and stay and visit and actually be one, become one with the area. It's beautiful, it's lush, it's green all the time. It's a really beautiful place to go and visit. Uh, during the spring and the, and the fall, you'll see a lot of migrating birds uh, all year round, you'll see bighorn sheep where you can, if you're lucky. There are, once things are blooming, you'll see a lot of bees. And don't forget, we have over 700 native bee species in the Mojave, right? So this is a great place to go and visit and watch animals. It's also um, an area where the train goes through. So if you're a train enthusiast, that's a great place for you too. Bonanza Springs, uh, these photos are actually from the MDLT. They were, I found them um, online at mdlt.org. And the beautiful thing about Bonanza Springs is it is located kind of just south and east, the southeast portion bottom of the Turtle Mountain Wilderness area. And Bonanza Spring is one of these 
really amazing, beautiful areas that you don't expect to see. This lush garden, this beautiful area with all of these trees, with all of this life. And one of the things that kind of would, would or could impact that area was that Cadiz water, uh, the Cadiz Inc. water pumping project. That eventually didn't go through. But the, the thing is, is that the aquifer, it, it was unknown if the aquifer that feeds Bonanza Spring also feeds into the Cadiz Valley, right? So it was unknown if taking water from that aquifer would eventually impact this one and how bad would that impact it? This spring has been here for at least 10,000 years, right? So it's also a great place to go and visit um, you'll want to check the BLM website before you go. That's part of leave no uh, part of the leave no trace principles is know before you go. Uh, as Bonanza Springs is located off of the Highway 66, off of Route 66, and if anybody's been there in a while, you'll know that the road is closed at Kilbaker, so you either have to park off of the highway and walk and get around that way, it's gonna be a long walk. You'll need to have a four by four vehicle to get back there. So definitely check, plan ahead and prepare, All right? Know before you go. So 49 Palms Oasis is also located in Joshua Tree National Park. It is located on the kind of north central part, north central east part of the park. And it is a three mile round trip. It's an out and back. Um, it's a three mile round trip area to get to this, these native fan palms. Uh, they're Washington, Washingtonia folifera. And they are, uh, this is an amazing hike. It's a moderate hike, but it is amazing. And you, climb into the area, you hike into that area and you, it's like Sarah said, you're completely transported. It is, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. Um, now I wanna go for a hike again. It is uh, amazing, it is beautiful. Sometimes though, um, it is closed during the summer for multiple reasons. One, it gets too hot and it's a, it's a pretty hard hike. So it gets too hot, so they'll close it for that but also in times of dry, when it's really dry, the animals need this area to come and feed. So they'll close it for um, the animals, uh, like bighorn sheep, Ovis canadensis, Nelsoni. I mean, they use it, they need it. So we'll close it, they close it to visitors at certain times. And um, that is a picture of my son. I couldn't crop him out, sorry. Not that I, you know what I mean. Big Morongo Canyon Preserve. This is another um, close by place to where we are. It's in Morongo Valley. And it is beautiful. It's part of Santa Snow uh, National Monument. It's also managed by the BLM and the Friends Group. It's also another nonprofit, Friends of Big Morongo Canyon Preserve. And they hold, they hold um, education there as well as guided hikes and bird talks and bird walks. And it's a known birding hotspot. So it is a wonderful place to go if you are interested at all in looking at the beautiful lush desert area that is really nice and green and identifying birds and bees and bugs and bobcats and all kinds of animals call this place home. It's also home to the Marsh Trail, which is a one mile trail. You'll see all these planks, this boardwalk that is quite accessible. And there are places to stop along and rest and visit and just, it's a wonderful place to go and um, visit. I keep saying visit a lot. Cottonwood Spring and Lost Palm Oasis. So if you live in the Coachella Valley and you want to go see an oasis, go to, go to Joshua Tree National Park on the south side in Cottonwood. Off, 
off the road, before you get to the Cottonwood Visitor Center, there is a right-hand turn if you're heading north or a left-hand turn if you're heading south. And it takes you to Cottonwood Springs. It is also an accessible trail. And then if you are fit and ready to go and visiting in the spring, the early spring, winter, fall, when it's cold, try Las Palmas Oasis. It's seven miles round trip, but it is definitely considered a strenuous hike and it is not something recommended um, during the summer. That is how you end up being part of the search and rescue, right? Being a search and rescue, not on the team. 1ing to visit some places, wanting to visit Joshua Tree. We're going to go through this real quick, my friends, because I assume you know that everybody can under, will be able to read the screen and you can see that we have an $80 annual pass and that gets you into any of the national parks. Uh, well, most national parks, most national park service um, units. It gets you into BLM, most federal, uh, federally owned public lands that charge a fee, the uh, America the Beautiful Pass will cover you. The military pass, this one changed recently. It is for current and past military members and their dependents and Gold Star families. And it is free to all of those folks. There is a free access pass with those who have permanent disabilities. Uh, you can get that access pass and uh, use it at any of the same national parks, any of those areas. And then there is a lifetime senior pass or a $20 annual pass for seniors. Those are folks 65 and older. For those kiddies, for the folks who have kiddos, uh, there is a fourth grade pass called, it, that is a federal pass. It's the America the Beautiful Every Kid Outdoors that works like one of those annual passes and it works from August to August for all your fourth graders. It gets that fourth grader and their family in that vehicle into the parks for free. And there's also now, this is pretty new, is the California State Adventure Pass, which is also for California, only California resident, fourth graders. And that gets you into 19 different state parks the closest park to us that has uh, that takes the adventure pass that also has some oases is uh, Anza Borrego State Park. So that would be that would be a good place to to use it there. And you you better know that when my kids are in fourth grade, they get the pass. It's a it's great. Take use that resource. So. The principles of Leave No Trace, this is a picture of Afton Canyon, so that is part of the Mojave River right there. Uh, the Leave No Trace principles are plan ahead and prepare. So know before you go, plan where you're going, let someone know where you're going, when you expect to be back, prepare for your trip, wear the appropriate kind of clothing, make sure you bring plenty of water, one gallon a person, one gallon per person per day, right? At least, minimum. So make sure you have all of the things, you know where you're going, you have maps. You wanna make sure that your car can make it to places that you're trying to drive it. Right? Know your, have a plan for where you're visiting. Travel and camp on durable surfaces. Maybe you're wanting to come out and visit these places and are going to do dispersed camping. Camp and travel on durable surfaces only. A lot of dispersed campsites have already been disturbed. They're going to be right off of the road. So camp in places that have already been disturbed. Dispose of your waste properly. Don't be that person. If you bring it in, bring it out. Pack in, pack out, right? Whatever you take with you, you can take out with you. Leave what you find. This includes cultural resources. This includes uh, rocks and flowers and anything you might find that you think is of value, leave it. Okay, there were 3 million visitors last year to the park or just over, I forget exactly, but it was 3 million people. If each one of those 3 million people took one flower, what would happen to the ecosystem? 
if each of those 3 million people took one rock, what would happen? You know, rocks are not, people don't think of rocks as being really important for the environment, but they create windbreaks, they help trap in moisture, they provide these areas where little seeds can start and grow and, and finally take hold, right? So rocks are actually really important, not just because I'm a rock fan, all right? Minimize, oh, leave what you find is, leave what you find, leave only footprints, take only pictures, right? Minimize your campfire, keep your campfire as big as you need it. A lot of the, due to the, the change in climate, due to the, uh, the drought, we're seeing severe wildfires, right? Keep your fire as small as you need it. You can go to preventwildfire.ca to learn more about getting a campfire permit and to learn more about uh, fire safety. And of course, respect wildlife. We're talking about these areas that are ecologically sensitive, that are ecologically important. You wanna make sure that you respect all of the wildlife you see. We're not going to harass the animals. We don't want to get up and take pictures of them, leave the tortoises, don't touch them, right? You're gonna transmit diseases. So leave and leave the wildlife alone and respect them. And lastly, be considerate of others. Uh, I love my music. Some people might not like my music. I'm not gonna play it really loud. I want to be outdoors and enjoy nature. I wanna to listen to the sounds of nature. I don't necessarily wanna to listen to the sounds of other people's music, right? I'm going to be respectful and step to the side uh, if they're hiking quicker than me. So be considerate of other people who are using the same resources. And lastly, I want to leave you with this, this kind of idea that all of these places are important and really interesting to go visit, but don't forget they're sacred to the Native American communities. This actually, this picture is of Corn Springs, which is outside of the Mojave. It's in the Colorado desert. There is a great place to go and bird and animal watch and camp. There's a developed campground, but there are also Native American petroglyphs in that area. These areas are really sacred and important for all of us to protect, not just for now, but for the future as well, okay? So that's what I kind of wanna leave you with. The, these are going to be places that inspire you to protect and preserve and conserve. And all of the links to the resources I used and that I talked about are in the chat as well. So we're gonna go ahead and open up the Q&A. If you have a question, go ahead and pop it into the chat. Um, oh, I think two things are real quick. So I think oh. people that might've logged in later might not have gotten the, the chat link. So maybe we just have to, to copy that back in there. Um, and then- Oh, the links are at the very top of the chat. They're the first thing in the chat. Okay. And then, yeah, and then we did, oh, and I did get a question here. Um, Go for it. It was about, it was about the arson fire um, at the Oasis of Mara. Um, so just not going into any specifics just because I don't think we have enough time for that. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, you know, that was a arson fire that was, um, you know, by an individual and that was not sanctioned by the tribal community. Um, there is a great difference between uh, traditional burning and um, traditional burning and, you know, plain arson. For traditional burning, you know, it's it's to revitalize the the plants. It also can be part of sacred ceremonies. But what happened at the oasis was uh, it was arson, um, and there and uh, as you said, there was a cutting of the palms, which is also, you know, a cutting of the ancestors. And so we have been working with um, Joshua Tree National Park. Um, and actually have had multiple uh, meetings about that. And uh, we've 
I think come up with a with a with a solution. But as these are uh, sacred ancestors, um, the solution is not publicly available. Um, I did. Someone mentioned uh, that when you pack out, that includes any waste materials from you or your four-legged companions. Yes. Please make sure whatever comes in goes out. Um, I'm not interested in picking up after uh, your animals. So go ahead and you know be a responsible pet owner. Okay. Um, and then I think two questions might be for you. Uh, repeat the name of the oasis in the last photo. Oh, um, that's Corn Springs. And then, this is Corn Springs uh, Campground. And um, this one to get to it is off of the 10. And um, it is a, I want to say it's a, like a five mile dirt road, but I have a small car and it was able to make it down that road. So it's, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good, decent road to drive down. Just take it slow. And then we also have, uh, someone says, I want to escape my neighbors in lawn. Do I need to tell them first? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I would. I would think you want to tell your neighbor before you're going to do anything to their yard. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Yeah. So, and I think that um, what's it? If there's no other, I don't know if there's any other questions, but I think they they have our contact information. Uh, oh. Oh my goodness! You know what, everybody? I just realized what was happening. There you go. I realized what was happening. So there's more of this, more of the links. Uh, yeah. Could you... Uh, could you speak to the corporate use of water in California for bottled water? You know, I'm going to be honest right now. I have, you're welcome. I have very strong uh, thoughts and opinions and those are not necessarily, um, Once that would be shared by other folks, there are a lot of uh, aquifer draining in in areas that are already and that have already been degraded. Um, think about where LA is getting its water from. Some of it is coming from the Sierra Nevadas, right from the Owens Valley, which was one of those really large uh, Pleistocene lakes, and you, it was drained in the 19 teens to create uh, water for, to water LA's lawns. And it started pulling water from all those aquifers and damaging those resources. And yet there's still bottled bottle water facilities up that way. So you can draw your own conclusion on, on what you think is happening to that, to that resource. Um, and it's, it would be great if we used it and reused it and created wastewater treatment facilities. I think, honestly, creating sustainable resources is one of the biggest challenges that we'll be facing um, as the climate warms up, as these resources get tapped for more and more water, uh, especially things like the Colorado River you know, it's not receiving as much rain as it used to. And it's just one of those things that we need to be more conscious about the resources that we're using. Yeah, that, I think we're out of time. Um, we, so, oh, we sure are, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think maybe, yeah, we might have some more continued campfire talks and continued, it seems like we have some some yeah some conversations conversations that need to continue. So, 
I uh, hope to yes. see you all again soon. And I thank you all for joining in. Thank you, everybody. You all have a great evening. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Have a, have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Bye, everybody.